Hello and welcome back to Build a CubeSat. I'm Manuel and today I have a short side note for you about direct to sell technology. Satellite phones and companies that offer such services have been around for decades. But for a few years now, some new companies have been working on developing a satellite network that could work with regular old cell phones without needing any special hardware. They do this by basically being a cell phone tower in orbit. The goal would of course be to not only have voice connection or SMS connection, but also offer higher bandwidth data connection. Two of these companies are Link and AST Space Mobile, or AST Space Mobile, I'm not sure. Link has three operational satellites that were launched in 2022 and 23. They have demoed their tech and seem to be in the process of forming partnerships with various cell network operators. As Space Mobile has launched a nanosatellite in 2019 and then an absolutely humongous beast of a tech demo in 2022. In fact, this is the largest commercial communications array launched to date as of making this video. Of course, this came with a bunch of understandable backlash from astronomers as it is a super bright object in the sky and can easily be seen with regular telescopes. They did demo 5G capability recently, but as far as I can tell, it's not quite certain at the moment if they will get a license to operate something like 245G satellites. Nonetheless, AT&T, Google and Vodafone have just made a 200 million investment in them in early 2024. Now, the moment the whole direct to sell idea started gaining some mainstream media attention was when SpaceX announced their partnership with T-Mobile in August of 2022. When you think about it, it does make a lot of sense. Starlink was ready by far the largest and most advanced LEO constellation, and each satellite has a substantial power budget. So incorporating direct to sell technology in the new V2 version of the satellite and thus effectively expanding the Starlink service to cell phones seems like a great idea. Of course, they need the appropriate licenses to operate in the RF spectrum frequency bands that are used by cell phone networks, which is why they need to partner with companies like T-Mobile in the US. If you're interested in this for your own use, here is the currently known list of carriers that are going to roll this out first. So just for reference, cell phones operate between 1 and 5 gigahertz, while the Starlink network works in multiple bands between 10.7 and 52.4 gigahertz. This, along with the fact that cell phone signals are really weak by the time they reach the about 500 km orbit, is the reason why Starlink satellites need a hardware upgrade to enable the ETC capability. That's what SpaceX is doing with the V2 minis and the much larger V2s that are going to be launched on Starship. So, another driver for the urgency with which uh, SpaceX is moving the Starship program along. The first batch of six DTC-enabled V2 minis was launched just recently from when I'm making this video on January 2nd, 2024, and another 840 will follow just in the first half of this year. With a total DTC constellation of 7,500 satellites, of course, pending FTC approval. At first, only SMS communications will be enabled, and this has also been demoed a few days after the launch of the first batch. Voice, data and IoT will follow no earlier than 2025. Of course, it's easy to see how it would make a great deal of sense to incorporate this feature in future Tesla vehicles, if they don't just go for a full Starlink integration. So, what happened then after this uh, SpaceX T-Mobile partnership was announced? Well, Apple announced a partnership with Global Star to bring emergency services to the iPhone 14, which they promptly started to roll out in November of 2022. You may know Global Star if you have ever used one of those spot GPS asset trackers, as they too run on that same network. Fun fact, Apple alone may occupy up to 85% of Global Star's network capacity, which is probably why they are lending them a quarter billion dollars to build out their satellite network. Then, in early 2023, Qualcomm announced a partnership with Iridium and a satellite-enabled chipset, which they later withdrew as no phone manufacturer showed interest in buying into a proprietary DTC solution. Iridium then rebranded the effort as Project Stardust and re-announced it in early 2024 with testing set to start in 2025 and rollout in 26. So, with all of this momentum, I think it's safe to say that DTC will be ubiquitous by the end of the decade, and Euroconsole predicts it will already be a billion dollar market by 2027. 
That's all well and good, but what does it have to do with my CubeSat project, you ask? Well, as you may know, designing and implementing a RF system is a wildly complex undertaking, even more so for space applications. So my thinking is, if you can just use a regular LTE modem and have an actual TCP IP connection, not just a low bandwidth um, RF connection to some ground station, but just internet access, just like this in your CubeSat. Um, this may be a massive game changer for designing and building uh, small satellites. And I think it will make it much more accessible for universities, small and medium businesses, and even individuals. Of course, there are many more implications when communications become trivial. With about 20% of CubeSats not starting to communicate after successful deployment, it's very hard to say what went wrong exactly. Two-thirds of all missions fail within the first 100 days, with about half of these failures being attributed to the communication system or unknown causes. I have linked this fantastic paper that looks into why CubeSat missions fail in the description. So once you take comms failure out of the equation, a few things start to change. With better knowledge about why CubeSats fail, less of them will do so in the long run, and this may even reach a point where the risk, the risk becomes low enough that it becomes insurable. I don't have a hard figure at hand, but anecdotally I think most CubeSats mission today launch without insurance because they are mostly considered R&D projects and you know, low cost in the, in, the, in the context of spaceflight. But still, as it stands today, if your CubeSat is dead on arrival, you have probably sunk a few hundred thousand dollars into this with no return on your investment. One might even envision a future where launch service companies like Nanorax and Exalaunch uh, offer a dedicated TTC module along with their testing and integration services. And to top it off, why not also offer insurance then? As a matter of fact, a few days after writing the script for this video, I stumbled upon a company called N61 who are developing a really interesting backup comms module that seems to aim exactly at lowering the small set failure rate. And even more interestingly, if we look at their datasheet, it mentions using the Iridium network for inter-satellite communications and note that you don't need a license for this. That's a super interesting development that I would like to take a closer look at in a future video. In any event, they have a suborbital tech demo launch out of Sweden coming up soon, so head over to their website if you want to learn more. I did put a link in the description. A similar kind of module is this owl thing that is made by a company in Hungary, I think. It seems to be more of a positioning device, but it does have a TRL-9, so it has been proven in space already. So that's also a, a very interesting um, development that I would like to learn a bit more about. Now, of course, there are also some reasons why DTC may not work for satellite applications on a purely technical level. Um, first of all is the power consumption. I mean, if you use 5G often on your phone, you may have noticed that it does draw um, a lot of power. Maybe in like five to six years there, there will be lower power LTE 5G modems, but still, that's of course a big concern for a satellite application. The second and maybe most critical problem is Doppler shift and timing. As the satellite passes over at, let's say, 500 kilometers, it's moving at about 7.6 kilometers per second while you are standing still on the ground. Even if these DTC services will be designed to work on airplanes that move at around 0.25 kilometers per second, the satellite will still assume it's moving about 7.3 kilometers per second faster than your cell phone and will thus assume a certain Doppler shift for the signal as it gets pushed together or expanded as the satellite passes over, much like the sirens of an ambulance passing by. Also, it will assume that your cell phone is about 500 kilometers away, so an RF signal will take about 1.5 milliseconds to reach the ground from low Earth orbit. Now, on the other hand, if we are not talking about a cell phone, but a CubeSat with an LT modem instead, it will be only about 100 kilometers away, so the signal will only take 0.3 milliseconds, and the Doppler shift could be much lower or much higher, depending on the respective orbits. So probably a consumer DTC service will not work on a CubeSat, but maybe some DTC provider will see the small set market as an opportunity and start offering a dedicated um, DTC service. And my fingers are of course firmly crossed for this. 
But even if the tech somehow works out, I'm sure that the ITU and other RF regulating bodies um, are going to have a, a word to say about using, you know, cell phone frequency bands for inter-satellite communications. As it stands now, we can only observe how DTC evolves in the coming years and uh, find out if we can make use of it for CubeSat communications. If you are interested in communication satellites in general, um, Scott Mandler has made a three-part series about their history. I will put a link in the description. So thank you very much for watching. Let me know if you like this side note and I will see you in the next video.